Welcome to Mount Zion United Methodist Church. My name is Jen Tabor Osterfeld. I'm the Minister of Christian Education here at Mount Zion. Here with me today is our pastor, Reverend Dr. Vaughn Hayden, Director of Music Ministry, Allison Kerr, and our lay leader, Johnny Hines, uh, this morning for worship. We want to remind you to check our website at mzumc.com for a copy of our bulletin and to fill out the attendance sheet so we know who's worshiping with us this morning. Coming up in August, we have drive-in worship services scheduled for August 2nd, August 16th, and August 30th at 11 a.m. on the Field of Grace, which is at the corner of Route 408 and Bayard Road, just at the Circle in Lothian. And these services will be in addition to the live streaming services we have at 9 a.m. on Sundays, and the services will be different, so you can join us at both times if you want. Don't forget that if you have children and grandchildren to check out our Lego Club, which is on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m., and our children's messages on Friday at 7 p.m., both air on Facebook. Breakfast Club is continuing to provide food bags to families in need at several of the local mobile home parks. If you'd like to donate non-perishable foods to Breakfast Club, there's a box on the front porch of Mount Zion Church so you can make a no-contact drop off. I think that's all I have in terms of announcements to share with you this morning, but be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page and like our Facebook page so you can stay up to date on all of our ministry and worship opportunities. With that, if you will bow with me for a word of prayer. God, you are love. Let us set aside the love we have for ourselves and this world and truly love you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Let us show our love for you in the way we joyfully obey your commandments. Let us love others, not as this world would have us love, but love others in the sacrificial way that you, God, love us. If we can love the way you call us to love, then oneness and unity can truly be achieved. As we enter worship this morning, may our hearts and minds be open to your word, clear our minds of all distractions so we can be joined together with the body of Christ in this moment to praise you and worship you. Let our worship today not be about our desires and satisfaction, but focused solely on you. And when we leave this time of worship, help us make our lives worship to you in love. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. We encourage you at home to join us and stand this morning for our first hymn, I Surrender All. Surprise! 
first scripture reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the, the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Second reading this morning is from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We invite you again to join us in song this morning. You stood before creation, eternity in your hands. And you spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what could I say? What could I do? This life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what could I say? What could I do? Oh God. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Allison, for that. Well, good morning. I am your pastor, Reverend Dr. Vaughn Hayden, and I'm glad to be here to worship, to lead you in worship, and I'm excited about uh, today. I'm excited about what we've been learning from uh, uh, lessons from King Josiah, and, and uh, with all we've learned, um, the question is, so now what? Now what do we do with all that we've learned? Uh, we've been following along with the story of King Josiah, learning lessons from his kingdom, le- lessons from how he responded when he inherited this kingdom when he was eight years old. We understand that uh, the kingdom had suffered under nearly 60 years of horrible, non-spiritual leadership, and how Josiah began to pursue God, how he des- desired and began to repair the temple. We know how the book of the law was surprisingly found in the temple, and Josiah was grieved when he heard it read for presumably the first time. We know how he repented and how he sought God for direction and what to do, and how, as we learned last week, how the prophet declared both wrath and mercy in fulfillment of justice. So now what? Now what? There was no doubt the nation deserved the judgment that was coming soon as the prophet declared. The nation deserved the punishment, the wrath of God. Because they had failed to keep God's covenant. For so many years they had failed to walk in God's ways. And and God had been clear about it, how he wanted to bless if they chose to follow him and, 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 and walk in his ways. And yet they chose to reject him. And yet here, King Josiah A young man, still in his 20s, was a king who wanted to fix it. He wanted to to make it right. He wanted to to repair what was broken. And as he desired to do that, God promised to be merciful to him because he had a heart for God. Well, hallelujah. But where did that leave the rest of the nation? What would become of God's people? Is there anything that could be done for them? Isn't that the question we've been kind of asking as we see what's going on in our nation. We, we see and know that our own country is in tremendous upheaval. I don't think I'm surprising you when I say this. Well, we, we, we may not agree with all of the issues or concerns. It's clear something has gone wrong. Something is amiss with all the uh, issues that we've been dealing with. We have not been seeking God or God's direction. As a nation, we have not been seeking God for some time. We have, nearly 60 years ago, taken God out of schools. We've tried to remove God from the public space. We try to take God out of all that we are as a nation. Then we wonder, how did we get here? I may not be a genius, but I think there may be a correlation. I think it might make sense. And so what do we do? I mean... And I'm going to step on toes today. I've been doing that a lot lately. I hope you wear steel toe shoes. But see, even in our churches, oh boy. Even in our churches, we have failed to do the right thing. Even in our words of our own communion liturgy, at least we're honest about it. In our own communion liturgy, we admit we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. Why haven't we? Why aren't we? So what can we do? How can we fix it? Are we condemned because of mistakes others have made or even mistakes that we have made? Does that condemn us because of our mistakes? Isn't that what Jesus came for? To fix it? To help us even though we do wrong? To, to, to forgive us and to allow us to start over? Of course that's what Jesus came for. Is there something we can do, some action we can take, or is it completely out of our hands once we have turned away? Is there no turning back? Well, as we continue the story from 2 Kings, chapter 23, we finished chapter 22 last week, we continue in chapter 23 this week, we see what King Josiah determined what, what he was going to do. After having sought the words of God from the prophetess Huldah, we see how he responds beginning in verse 1 of chapter 23. It says, Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. Josiah realized that this was a national problem. 
So he called all the elders of the nation to gather. That's a Judah and Jerusalem. That's the big city and the nation around it. Everybody. Now the elders in this context are those with authority in their community. They were family leaders, not really elected positions, but men who were responsible for their families, responsible for their clans, responsible for their communities. They were the ones who would often judge at the city gates. They, would, they were the ones who would use to communicate and enforce the king's declarations. They were the ones who would be called out to live out whatever the king said for the sake of the nation. And so notice that Josiah called all the elders to this event because every part of the nation, elders from everywhere, were involved in the trouble. It wasn't just a few. It wasn't just those near the pagan shrines, nor just those responsible for the desecration of the temple. But all the elders in the nation were called to come to this assembly because all would be responsible for what they were about to hear. Now, I'm kind of cheating because I know what's going to happen next. But just bear with me because we know he, he, he understands what's going to happen. And it's not just a few, but it's everybody. I know I'm not being subtle here. But I fear that so often we like to think that the issues are other people's problems. We like to think, well, if they would come in here, then it could be fixed. If those people who are creating the problems would just understand. But that's not the way we see it in the scripture. In this context of the Bible, and I believe in the context of the nation, we're all in this together. We all need to recognize our responsibility and our role. Whether it's great or small, we all have some part. We cannot just shrug it away or shirk it aside. While it may be true that some may be more responsible than others, it does not relieve each of us from our role. Nevertheless, Josiah called all the elders. And once they were assembled, he led them to the temple. (laughs) I love that part. I haven't got there yet, but okay, verse 2. Okay, the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him went all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. As I've been saying, the king knew to repair the nation meant to restore worship. That's the first thing he had to do. We started that a few weeks ago, to restore the temple and to put God in the right place in the lives of the people. So when he gets everybody together, the first thing he does is take them all to the temple. Let's everybody, we're gathered together, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's get it right from the start. He takes the whole nation to church, for goodness sake. Hallelujah. Man, I get excited thinking about that. Imagine if... Everybody showed up at church on a Sunday. Now, I know this may shock you, but there's not enough seats in the churches if we were allowed to come in them. Even in the nation, with all the churches we have, not enough seats in every church for people to come. (sighs) And yet, they're still not full. They should be full every week when we can do that again. Maybe they will be when we can do that again. I hope so. So he takes everybody to church. But it wasn't to show off the repairs and renovations he made in the temple. We don't even know if they were completed yet. It doesn't say that. But he took them all to the temple for one purpose. Well, actually it's two, but we'll talk about the other one next week. But for now, the one purpose was so that they could, in the sight, in the shadow of the temple of God, where it was believed in some ways that God resided there, they could hear for themselves the word of God. It says, all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, small and great, everybody was there. Now, I know in verse 1 it says he only called the elders, but guess what? Everybody showed up. Hallelujah. Oh, man, I could preach about this a little bit. When you call the dads, oftentimes you get the whole family. I could talk about that. Anyway, everybody. Hmm. 
it's clear that this message that he's about to declare, that he's about to read, is for everyone. Every family, it says, every class. He mentions a couple jobs, every status, every member, great, small, every body needed to hear this. They all needed to go to the temple. They all needed to worship. They all needed to experience God. They all needed to engage with the word of God. It's not just for some. It's for everybody. Oh, I've been preaching that for a while because you know what? It's still true. It's, it's, not, it's not less true now than it was then. Everybody needs this book because this book is for everyone. God wants us all to know him. He wants the best for our lives. He created us so that we could have a great life. He wants us to have, and he wants us to know him, and he wants us to know how to live because if we follow his commands, if we follow his words, we will live good, right, holy lives, and there will be peace among us. We all need it. Hallelujah. So everybody goes to the house of the Lord. And when they got there, what did they do? Did they just show up, punch their ticket, and go home? No. When they got there, the king stood up in front of everybody and read the whole book of the covenant. The whole thing. In front of everybody. Now, there's some discrepancy whether this was all five books of Moses, the Pentateuch as we know it, the Torah, the law, or was it just Deuteronomy, which is called the Book of the Covenant. Earlier in 22, he says the Book of the Law, which we believe is all of them. But Deuteronomy is considered the Book of the Covenant. We, we don't know which one, but regardless, I know this. It was not just 20 minutes. It was not just a half hour of listening to the Word of God proclaimed. According to Christian author Travis Agnew, the whole Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy, if you stood there and read it in one setting, you might have to take a drink from time to time, it could be read in 14 hours. That's one day. And still time to sleep. So it's feasible that they stood there for the whole reading of the books of Moses. But it may be more likely that it was just the book of Deuteronomy, which could be read in just under three hours. So that's not a long service, right? Hallelujah. Man, that sounds good. How's that for a church service, huh? Yeah, but just under three hours. And they didn't even have singing necessarily. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit. Just reading the whole book of Deuteronomy. If we had a church service and I just read the whole book of Deuteronomy, it would be spectacular. But it would be devastating. It would be wonderful, and it would be heart-wrenching. I would need to take breaks, not because I'd need some water, but because so much of it would be so convicting and challenging and heartbreaking. To hear what God requires, to know how much of it I have failed, all in one setting, to hear about the oneness of God, to hear about the deliverance from slavery, to, to hear about the Ten Commandments, the need to teach our children, the need to, to put the, the Word of God in front of our eyes and on our doorpost, the, to, to hear the regulations about worship, about how to treat each other, about how to treat foreigners, to hear, to hear all about the blessings and cursings, about the dangers of serving other gods, all the while knowing, at least in this time when they're reading it, that they're in a land that worships other gods. How could they stand there hearing about God's covenant and God's promises to his people and knowing how far from God the nation had gone? How could we stand there knowing how far from God our nation is gone. Tremendous conviction. Tremendous travail. I would have needed a break. Or I would have broken down. Which may be the entire point. That may be the entire point of it. 
After all, well, the king, when he heard the words first read, what did he do? He broke down. He tore his clothes. He repented. He knew his sin. Paul says the law came to reveal sin. And indeed, when the law was read, he knew what a sinner he was. And so perhaps as he read the law, read the covenant to the whole nation, he wanted them to break down too, to, to break down to their knees, to realize their sin, whatever part they may have taken in it, and to hear how it hurts God, to hear how God wanted, desired, promised better for them. And they chose not the good of God, but chose the evil of not God. They chose it. Perhaps the king wanted everyone to have the chance, like he did, to make it right. Not by simply changing all those things around them, which the king would be doing soon, as we'll see next week. But by allowing each to feel the conviction, to understand for themselves why the changes were being made, and to give each person a chance to change inside. Because that's where the change needs to happen before the outside changes can make any difference. Because the outside changes simply cover up what the real issues are unless the inside changes. Jesus talked about that. Why do you clean the outside of the cup while the inside is so full of hypocrisy? Perhaps one of the most important lessons from King Josiah is in verse 3, where he leads by example. In verse 3, the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keeping his commandments, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book all the people joined in the covenant. That's what the scripture says. I didn't add that. That's what the Bible says. Now, I don't think the king was doing this just to put on a show. I don't think he called everybody there just so they could see him proclaim this covenant. Look what me and God are doing. He was doing this as a sincere effort to lead the people into what was right. Now, the covenant initially when it was made was between God and the people, not just between God and Moses, not just between God and Joshua. It was between God and the people. So as, I, as Josiah wants to fix it, he's like, between God and the people, I'm leading it, but it's for you. I mean, he had already sought God. He had already known he was going to be given mercy. He had already fixed it in a way. But he wanted to fix it not just for him, he wanted to fix it for everybody. And so now, as the book was read, it became clear what to do. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 3, part of what I believe was read that day, make it plain. It says, when all these things have happened to you, the blessings and the curses that I have set before you, if you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God... And you and your children obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, just as I am commanding you today. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, gathering you again from all the peoples among whom the Lord your God has scattered you. See, this is in the covenant. God wants to have compassion. God wants to show mercy. But we have to return to him. We have to seek him. We have to love him with all our heart and all our soul. We have to obey his words. This isn't what I say. It's what God's word says. It's what Josiah said to the nations as he read the book of the covenant. Josiah, for his part, was making a covenant with God. He was returning to the Lord. He was loving the Lord with all his heart and soul. Just as Moses and Joshua had made these covenants on behalf of the people in the open assembly with all watching, so just Josiah declaring, desiring to be holy, wanting to be right in the eyes of God, followed the steps laid out in the word. He knew what he was doing was right. He knew it was the only right step to take, but he could not do it privately. He could not do it in his prayer closet. He needed to do it out in the open. As a leader, he led the people back to God. 
Oh, godly leadership. That sounds so nice. He publicly declared his commitment. He publicly declared his covenant with God so that all could see his example, his sincerity, and his contrition. But he could only do his part. He could only take his step. That was not the only step that needed to be taken. In order to renew the covenant with God and his people, the people needed to respond. Josiah could not respond for them. That's why he brought them all there. Because if he could have responded for them, he could have done it without them. But he needed them to come. He needed them to hear. He needed each person to make a response for themselves. He renewed his covenant. But the covenant was not with the person. It was with the nation. So the whole nation gathered under the conviction of the word of God. Witnessed the repentance Witness the contrition, witness the conviction and covenant of their king, and they responded as well. All the people joined in the covenant. Everyone was in agreement. Everyone admitted, I have sinned. I want to fix it. I want to love God. I want to obey God with all my heart. And all my soul. They had a choice to make and they chose for themselves. Josiah couldn't do it for them. If he could have, he would have. But he knew, he knew they needed to hear the words of God. They needed to come face to face with the reality of the situation they had been in. And they needed to understand why they were in the situation. Then they could understand how to get out of it by loving God. It's really that simple. For some reason, people want to look everywhere else to try to make things right. When the only thing that can satisfy has been there all along. We want to try to fix this section or that section, fix this ism or that ism, when what we really need to fix is our theism. We really need to fix our recognition of God, our relationship, our position. We try to fix all these other things. It's like we're fixing symptoms instead of the disease. Finally, when the word was read, the conviction came. And the people were all in agreement to covenant together to love God with all their heart and soul. So many lessons to learn. And they're not hidden or subtle. In a world that is in shambles, it is not a far cry to say we have lost our first love. We no longer seek God. We no longer love him with our whole heart. Here's the good news. We can fix that. We can fix that. Because we can choose to love God. He chose you. He chose us. We can choose him. We can choose to love him with our whole heart. We can declare our allegiance to the one who first loved us. And unlike Josiah, we, post-Pentecost, as we talked about a few months ago, we have even a more better opportunity. I don't know if those words go together, more better. But we, we can know God personally. We can have a relationship with Jesus. We can have the Holy Spirit living within us, helping us each day to make good and right decisions. And although we are under a new covenant through Jesus Christ, we don't have to make the old covenant because we have a new covenant through Jesus. That's what the communion symbolizes, a new covenant. But the obligation is the same, even though it's a new covenant. The obligation is the same. Jesus said it clear. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is the great commandment. It's not really new. It's what they were told to do a long time ago. But they failed. The obligation is the same. Love Jesus. Let Jesus fix all the rest. Eschew evil. Do the right things. Follow the Holy Spirit and let God transform you and the land. Oh, I hope you hear what the word is saying. I know (coughs) 
that I cannot stand on behalf of this country to fix this issue of sin. I cannot stand on behalf of this church. I can only stand on behalf of me. Because I have to make my own personal covenant. I have to fix my own personal issues, and I must start there. And I pray that our leaders would find and fill their role so that this nation would be blessed. But once we make our own personal covenant, then we can lead others to covenant together with us. A covenant is not just a promise between one person. Usually it's a promise between two sides. God will fulfill his side. We need to fulfill ours. This is where we must start. We must get ourselves right. And once we get ourselves right, we will pray and pray that God will have mercy, believing in the one who first loved us. So then, if we get this right, we can pray that God will allow the other leaders, the other people in this nation to get it right. It has to start with us. We'll talk more about that next week, why it has to start with us. But this morning, I want to encourage you. If you feel conviction of your sin, don't dismiss it. Deal with it. Talk to God. He wants to forgive you. He wants to have compassion on you. All he's ever wanted is for you to love him and obey. Today, you have the opportunity to renew your covenant with God. To just confess your sin and say, I want to make it right. I want to be restored and renewed. Don't miss your opportunity today. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promise. We thank you for your desire to make it right. That's why you went to the cross, so that our sins could be forgiven. That's why you came from heaven to earth in the first place, so that we could know you. We know you desire us. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have pursued us. We pray that we would understand and recognize our need to love you because you have the best plans for our life. So, Lord, help us to stop seeking other things, thinking there might be something good in that, but all that is good is in you. So, Lord, forgive us of our sins today. We pray that you hear our confession, you hear our heart, and that you would make it holy and pure and blameless. Help us, Lord, to love you with all of our heart and all our soul and all our mind and strength. And as we do that, Lord, help us then to love our neighbors as ourselves, knowing that you love them just as much as you love us. Lord, we truly desire to be your people. We desire to make this covenant, make it real, make it lasting, and heal our land. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to invite uh, our lay leader, Johnny Hines, to come forward and uh, help us in prayer this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our uh, prayer list is uh, um, online, and you can print it out, and I encourage you to print it out and keep it with you in your devotion time, he says, as I didn't bring mine today. But uh, I uh, hope you have a devotion time, and uh, if not, or if you you haven't been attending to it, I pray that this sermon will encourage you to return to and follow God's word. Let us go to uh, our Father in prayer. Dear Lord, we sang this morning, I Surrender All. Help us to move that from a aspirational to real in our lives. Help us to surrender the busyness of this world so that we can find time to spend with you and be blessed by your word. I pause for a moment to let us all think about those busy things that get in the way and how we're going to set them aside to know you better.
thank you and praise you, Father, for that encouragement and that guidance to spend time with you constantly, consistently, to be in prayer always. And Father, we bring our prayer list to you and know that you love to heal and restore, that you have the power and the will and the desire, and that we turn ourselves over to you, trusting you, not in our own ways, but in your ways, lifting up all of these illnesses and um, issues that uh, we face in the world, putting them at your feet and trusting in you. Also, Father, we lift up the chaos in this world that so much of it, if not all of it, stems from walking away from you and seeking the gods of man. Father, we ask you and thank you for being with our leaders, to guide them even in spite of themselves, to do what, what is right and just in your eyes. We thank you for the overcoming of COVID, not just a little, but completely. We thank you, Father, for being with all in the issues of facing our country today, that we can return to your ways and your guidance, your peace and your joy that you overcome all that Satan is trying to do. Father, we lift you up and praise you this morning that all of our fears and doubts and worries can be turned into joy and expectation to see your hand at work in our lives and in our country and in our world. Father, for those who do not yet know you and our friends and loved ones who we know uh, do not yet know you we lift them up to you that your holy spirit would prick their hearts yes. to draw them to you yes. praise you and thank you for all of these things father in jesus name we pray amen thank you and have a blessed day and week amen amen hallelujah i do want to thank you again for worshiping with us today we pray that you would enjoy uh, every time you gather together to worship in this way, and uh, of course we invite you to gather with us on the field when we have those worship services in August, we look forward to that, where we can at least see each other through the windows and through uh, uh, in, the, in the vicinity, but we do appreciate all, all that you do to continue to help the ministry to go forward, we're, as we're broadcasting out, you know, we're reaching people uh, all throughout the nation, and so we, we're grateful for all those that are helping to sponsor and support the ministry, for, uh, for those that are contributing by sending their, their tithes and offerings to 122 Bayard Road and to those that are uh, contributing through the, uh, the Push Pay app. We appreciate that. And just want you to know we really uh, do re recognize that uh, this is the ministry of the church and we're so grateful for you. Just pray that you would uh, 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 continue to support uh, all the ministries that we do. Uh, support the, the children's ministries, the breakfast club, uh, the, the other prayer times. As Johnny said, your, your private times. We do have devotions available for you as well. If we have our daily bread and, uh, and the upper room. If you would need devotions, we can get them to you. But if you want information about the prayer list and all those things, just send an email to christy at mzumc.com. You can find her on the, on the website. And, uh, or you can email me or Jen or Julie or Allison. We, we'd love to hear from you continue to make that connection. Now, if you would just take a moment with me as we close in prayer. Almighty God, we just love you. We thank you and praise you. We commit ourselves to you completely, our whole heart, our whole soul, all that we are. We know that we are nothing without you, but with you we can be everything because you are truly everything. Lord, I pray that you would help each one in whatever their situations they may be in as they struggle each day, and maybe they just rejoice each day. Let us rejoice with each other as we share the struggles and bury one another's burdens. Lord, we pray that you would be with this nation. As we struggle as a nation, I pray that we would determine and discern how best to find ourselves by seeking you and your word following in line with what great things you would have us to do and be. Lord, I pray that you would be with every nation and every leader around the world, that they would all recognize your plan 
is good and right and just for everyone. Lord, the people in every nation, in every tongue, in every tribe would confess Jesus Christ as Lord and worship you. Lord, we pray that you would be with the United Methodist Church, be with our bishop, our district superintendents, all our clergy and laity. Help us to be people that truly desire to spread scriptural holiness across the land, who desire to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world and desire to live in peace with one another. Bless every congregation, regardless of the denomination, that proclaims your word as truth, that stands up for what is right and just, and help us to all, as Christians, demonstrate to the world what the body of Christ is, loving, caring, holy, and just. Lord, that's who we are, that's who you are. Lord, help us to live that out. We pray that as we continue to try to live as you taught us to live, that we would continue to, in our prayer time, learn to pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may you go with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. May you go loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and renewing your covenant for now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week.